in our topic, life after death exposed, well, we've really got to consider what death is. And I started to have a look at some statistics and a very quite simple Google search where I looked at the oldest person uh, is currently 113 years of age. Um, they, the record was at 30th of June that they were uh, 112 and 327 odd days. Uh, so I'm guessing that they're still uh, with us because there was no evidence that he had passed away. So he'd be over 113 years of age now. Unfortunately, the oldest Australian has recently passed away. He was aged 111. And uh, these concepts of people living for long periods of time made me consider that our working life here in Australia runs through to where somewhere between 60 and 70 years of age and most likely 67 is the retirement age for many people here in Australia. And this employment componentry of things was rather interesting to consider that we spend a lot of time and money and a lot of our economy based around uh, the life or the failing health of many uh, people here in Australia, but it's also worldwide. You see, if the oldest person is 113 years of age, there's uh, you know, multiple billions, say 7 billion people, 6 billion people on the earth. That's a lot of people who are dying each year who don't get above 113. And when you consider that of the Australian government, they are prepared to spend about 15.7% of the Australian budget on the healthcare sector to try and keep people from illness and, and ill health and, and some injury um, in relation to what they're doing. But regardless of all that, we have about 143,000 Australians will die each year. So the saying that was drummed into us uh, that says the only certainty in life is death and taxes, well, that's pretty evident. Indeed, the, the only way uh, that seems to be happening here is that uh, each year Australians pass away and indeed people right around the earth pass away and the government is going to be spending money on trying to uh, employ people and, and make sure that their life is as good as it possibly can be in their older age. And so this concept of someone trying to extend their life is interesting because if the scenario was that someone would live beyond their date of death, then, and that new place in which they would go to was of some better place or substance, then why would the uh, economy of the world have a significant portion being spent around trying to maintain people to be alive? Wouldn't it be better for them to actually pass on to this new supposed place for them to go to? So it's an interesting scenario that we have about uh, 14 percent of our population of our working population engaged in trying to keep people alive uh, that's including all the the spin-off services of uh, and that's things like the car park that's next to a hospital you know that someone who's cleaning it they're not really a uh, health care provider but they are in in a spin-off industry in relation to that so we have a lot of people that are involved in this componentry of things so what does that really mean? So I thought I would then look at the life cycle and I'll look at what death actually is. So again, the life cycle of a human is as follows. There is a pregnancy period of time in which somewhere the cells create a small baby inside its mother 
and we at some point along there have uh, those cells forming a heartbeat and body component trees of limbs and and uh, then after birth we have a period of time of the infancy where the the child is very reliant on its parents through to a toddler phase then we're going into childhood where they're still learning and and uh, rapidly uh, growing in in what they're doing a time of adolescence where the body is changing uh, through a puberty period of time and a whole lot of uh, responsibilities and emotions are, are coming on through there. We then move into this longer period of time called adulthood and responsibilities continue to uh, arrive on the scenes at that point of time. And then we move into the senior years of uh, someone's life and, and they, their life starts to uh, you know, wane at the end of their life and their energy is uh, abates or reduces, as it were. After that completion of the senior years, we have the thing called death. So this life after death that we're considering. So what happens when a person actually dies? And again, I hopped onto our, our websites and the Australian government has a pretty good uh, article and I've got a reference right down there on the bottom uh, of the screen so anyone can look it up but the the article's a, a two-page document it's on the government website so you can look at it and read it and and uh, two-thirds of the way through that two-page document on the second page there they have this section that says what happens when someone dies and they they run through that and it says in time, the heart stops and they stop breathing. Within a few minutes, their brain stops functioning and entirely and their skin starts to cool. At this point, they have died. And many of us have experienced someone has passed away, maybe a loved one, maybe a family member that, has, uh, that we've been close to, that we might have gone to visit them just prior to them passing away and then maybe seeing them once they had passed away, had passed on, uh, passed away. And so here it tells us on this government website that the signs that someone have, has died is that there is no breathing or heartbeat. The person can't be woken up. Their skin becomes pale and waxy and their eyelids may be half open or closed and their pupils aren't fixed, uh, aren't looking or being able to be moved, they're fixed. And it says their mouth may fall open. And then it says, what happens after someone's died? It says, well, you might feel all sorts of emotions from grief that they are gone to relief from their pain is being over and any number of emotions in between. Take your time. It's fine just to sit with a person who has died for as long as you need to. If the death occurs in hospital, nursing home or hospice, then the facility will take care of the initial next steps for you. And I thought that was rather interesting that the Australian government has decided to put together a two page article about the process of things that happen when someone gets old in their senior years and passes away. What to expect, what the componentry of activity is going to be. Indeed, I thought what was really interesting was that second last bullet point on this screen here, where it says, what happens after someone has died? It says that you will have emotions of grief, but you might feel relief that uh, pain is over. Indeed, this is rather interesting because it directs the person, the reader's attention away from the person who has just been going through uh, end of life periods of time to being more concerned about the people that remain. And this is something that we're going to explore a little bit later on. You see, the concept that people have put together saying that there is something greater 
for humankind after death has more to do with making the people that remain feel better in relation to their grief that they're going through than actual fact or anything that is actually going on in relation to the people in relation to that point of time. So let's consider what that means. Well, that's exactly what the Bible actually tells us is going to happen. If we have a look at Psalm 146, the Psalms, middle of the Bible, and the Psalmist wrote many interesting short pieces, short Psalms. And in verse four of Psalm 146, it's recorded that his breath goeth forth. So his last breath goes out of a man, it says he returns to his earth. And in that day, his thoughts perish. A couple of books on the book of Ecclesiastes, chapter nine, we read there. It says, for the living know that they shall die, but the dead know not anything. Neither have they any more reward for the memory of them is forgotten. Also, their love and their hatred and their envy is now perished. Neither have they any more a portion forever in anything that is done under the sun. So the Bible is actually saying to us that once someone dies, their last breath goes out, goes forward, goes forth of them. And from that point forward, their knowledge, their memory, their thoughts, their love, their emotions have concluded. There's no, nothing more for them to do. And so that article that the Australian government had put together and published is quite accurate. It says in that time, it's, there's no emotion for the person that has just passed away. The grief is in relation to the people that have remained. And it's about how we are to cope with that scenario in which we have. So the concept then is, is there something else? Is there something more in relation to this? I thought when we were talking about the Bible and componentry of, um, componentry of good news, that the Bible was going to be telling us about living forever, that we've got an immortal soul, as it were, that's going to keep on living. So how come... The Bible also tells us that this person, as we just saw back in Psalm 146 and Ecclesiastes chapter 9, that there is no more emotion from that person. There is no knowledge. There is no breath in relation to them. What is the Bible's good news? And what is the real activity that's going to occur after someone's death? Well, to do that, we really need to understand why we believe the Bible. We need to have a look at how come humans actually die and what, therefore, does the Bible tell us in relation to life after death? Well, the concept of why we believe the Bible, we've held many uh, topics in relation to this. And if you have a look up the Bullaroo YouTube channel where you can find uh, this talk you can also find a couple of talks that we've already given and presented in relation to why the accuracy and belief in the bible is worth your consideration so but basically just quickly the bible is a collection of smaller books 66 books that have been written by multiple different authors and the theme of the Bible is connected from the beginning to the end. And the, it's a story that is woven around God and God's people, uh, how they are going to be reconciled back to God. And that is because what we read in Genesis chapter three was a breaking between mankind and God. We also know that 
throughout this record in the Bible that God actually details history of the world. And some of that history is actually in advance of the time that it occurs. When this occurs, it's called a prophecy. And many of these prophecies have been fulfilled during our lifetime in relation to that. And we can look at those prophecies again in other talks that you will find uh, on the Bullaroo YouTube channel. We'd love to see you um, looking at some of those over time. So the question then comes, how come humans die? Well, we had read for us Genesis chapter 3, so the third book of the Bible. No, the, sorry, the, the third chapter of the Bible in Genesis. And in the first five verses, we, we had read for us that there is a confrontation or interaction between a serpent and the woman called Eve. And the interaction was questioning what God had said. And we read in the third verse there that the woman, or oh, sorry, the second verse, the woman says to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but the fruit of the tree, which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat of it, neither shall you touch it, lest ye die. And the response was, you are not going to die. You shall not surely die. And this is the interesting componentry of things. You shall not surely die. That concept of not dying is what people have continued on to consider and think in relation to what happens when someone actually dies. And the serpent in verse five says, for God knows that in the day you eat thereof, your eyes are going to be opened and you shall be as gods knowing good and evil. Then we find verse six that the woman sees that the tree is good for food and pleasant to the eyes and a tree to be desired. She takes of the food, the fruit and eats and also gives to her husband does eat. The next section of Genesis chapter three discusses some of the emotions that they feel at that point of time in relation to themselves and also in relation to the time when God comes to uh, be reintroduced to them in that setting, in that garden setting, Genesis uh, 3 there. But at the conclusion of that, we're going to have a look here in verse 17 to 19, where the Lord says to Adam, because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of your wife or Eve and hast eaten of the tree, which I commanded you saying, thou shalt not eat of it. Because of this, cursed is the ground for your sake. In sorrow, you're going to eat of it all the days of your life. So it's going to be harder to generate food. Thorns and thistles, it's going to bring forth. And there, and thou shalt eat of the herb of the field. In the sweat of thy face, thou shalt eat bread till thou return unto the ground. For out of it wast thou taken. For dust thou art, and unto dust shalt thou return. So... What God is therefore saying to Adam is saying, your life from this point forward and for the humans that are going to come from you, your offspring, you're going to find that your life is somewhat cursed. There is going to be difficulty. There's going to be sorrow. You're going to have emotions that you didn't otherwise have. And you're going to need to put energy and effort into gathering food to supply for you and your family. And that's continued right down to our day. Uh, we're not all farmers today, but there is rarely uh, an easy day's work for anyone to be involved in, no matter what field of employment they find themselves in. 
We also see in verse 19 that in the sweat of thy face, you're going to eat bread. You're going to till the ground so you, to generate your income and to therefore earn your, your food. And then it says you're going to be going back to that ground. For dust thou art, and unto dust shalt thou return. You're going to pass away, and you're going to uh, deteriorate back into the dust, into into the elements that we find ourselves, that the human body finds themselves. Uh, and if we had look up in the componentries of biology, we find out that there is uh, out of our cells there's componentry of of water and and different components. Uh, that actually are put together to make our body cells. But once we die, they deteriorate and cease to, to live. And we deteriorate back into the dust, into the, into the raw elements. Uh, and if you go and dig up an, an old cemetery, you'll find that in relation to, to the bones of the people. They're, they're no longer there. But two things. I thought what I was told uh, through life's education and from visiting various you know, uh, people's funerals throughout life, that we somehow had a soul, that the Bible talks about a soul, and that this soul is going to live forever. And the second thing, that um, I thought we were told that uh, we were going to go to heaven when we die. Well, why, what's that about? And, and how does that fit together with what this concept that we've just seen in Genesis chapter 3 and that we're going back to the, to the earth into our raw elements? Well, let's once again see what the Bible says. Do we have a soul? Well, yes. The first time we read of this word soul is actually in chapter before Genesis 3, in Genesis chapter 2. And here we read in verse 7 that the Lord God formed man out of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living soul. And I thought it would be good here just to say, what is this word soul? And, you know, it's, it's an interesting word. And you see what happens in relation to uh, words is they, their meanings change over a period of time depending on things that are around us uh, and, and the concepts that are around us. And so we need to go back and consider what was this word meant by the translator when they were translating uh, the Bible and trying to find an English word to put there for the Hebrew word in this case. And so we're very fortunate in that we can look up uh, Bible dictionaries and concordances to be able to find out what the, the original word was in the language that it was written, and then be able to look at ways and that's been used elsewhere, uh, where that word has been found with throughout uh, the Bible, and also to look at what a definition of that word would be. And this word soul is the word nefesh, nefesh, as it were. I'm not very good at Greek, Hebrew, Latin, um, Chaldean, so um, bear with me. So that, that uh, word nefesh um, is, and we have a Strong's number written there, a Strong's uh, was a person who had coordinated uh, a list of every word that's been used within the Bible and uh, put a definition attached to it. And he, he the comment here from uh, Dr. James Strong was that Nefesh is properly a breathing creature. That is an animal or abstractly vitality or life as it were. So, what he's saying is that right here in the beginning, the very first use of this word is that when the Lord forms man and breathes life into him, he becomes a living or a life creature, a breathing creature. And that is the concept 
of what the soul actually is. So what else do we know about the soul? What else do we see in the Bible? Well, in Ezekiel, I'm sorry I haven't put the word Ezekiel there. So Ezekiel chapter 18 and verse 4, we read, Behold, all souls are mine as the soul of the Father, so also the soul of the Son is mine. So the concept here is that the life is passed from parents to children. And that's the, the time, you know, the life starts with the cells in the pregnancy period of uh, the life cycle that we looked at earlier. So it's saying is that the breath of life, which God breathed into Adam, is passed down generations from, from parents to children. And it says, you know, so it's the soul of the father was passed on from, from God to Adam, as it were. So the, the, the life was passed on, then the life from the father is passed on to the son. And then it makes this little comment. It says, the soul that sinneth, it shall die. And I make the comment here is that this refers back to Genesis chapter 3, where God said, to Adam in that because he had gone against the rules that or the law that uh, God set that he should not eat of that fruit of the tree that he was going to die and therefore as that life had been passed on from generation to generation those ongoing souls or those ongoing people are also going to die. Indeed, you could because we know that that occurs. I know that because I had a look at the statistics right at the beginning of this talk and looked at it and I said, if people didn't die, we would have people that are thousands of years old. But that's not the case. The oldest person we saw is like 113 years of age. Uh, everyone else has passed away. So from that concept, we, we need to consider that the description here in Ezekiel chapter 18 is, is accurate. Indeed, the life that is passed on from father to child or parent to child indeed carries that mortality and they do indeed pass away and die. So, the concept that some people would say is, but we go to heaven after we die. Isn't that the case? Well, that's often been thought. And if you go and have a look in Acts chapter 2, we have a concept of, or uh, sorry, a, a discussion going on between some very faithful uh, Jewish people who were trying to understand what Jesus' life, death and burial and resurrection was all about. And uh, there was people there that were trying to educate them, even though they had, um, had in their life read many parts of the Bible and had very in-depth discussions and they'd pass that information down from family to family and, and they'd had set up a whole uh, hierarchy of things and they called themselves Pharisees and scribes and they knew everything about the Bible as it were and they were still trying to understand what this concept of Jesus was. And in this chapter of Acts chapter 2, it is raised by the disciples of Jesus who were trying to educate their fellow Jews about what had happened. It says, men and brethren, let me freely speak to you about the patriarch David. He was one of their faithful kings of Israel in the Old Testament. Many things have been written about him. And if you see down the bottom of this screen, David is actually referred to in Hebrews chapter 11, as one of the many faithful people that uh, the history of Israel was built on. Uh, further, he was referred to as 
uh, David, the son of Jesse, a man after mine own heart, which shall fulfill all my will. You know, so in in re, in review of what he is doing and in, in his life, uh, he's a, a an amazing person. But it then goes on a few verses later in relation to this David, whose sepulchre was somewhere in the vicinity of Jerusalem, and people could go and see it and touch it. They also made the comment that. David is not ascended into the heavens. So the concept that some people had thought was that, you know, faithful people would go to heaven after they died. But the Bible quite clearly says in relation to someone who will fulfill God's will, someone after God's own heart, someone who's listed in the faithful grouping of, uh, of people of which there, I think there's only uh, 35 or so people that are actually mentioned in Hebrews chapter 11. So he's one of the exceptional faithful people in relation to that. It's saying that he hasn't gone to heaven. So if he's not gone to heaven, why would you think that someone who potentially may have only fleetingly thought about the things of God, go to heaven when they pass away. It doesn't really make sense. So let's try and explore this a little bit further. What is the hope of the Bible? And to understand the hope of the Bible, we've really got to understand what happens when we, when we do die in relation to that. And the first thing we're saying is that the first thing that happens is that you pass away and your, your knowledge and your memory and your emotions and your, your breath ceases in relation to that. But there is something else that the Bible talks about, and that is a resurrection from the dead. And this in a, is an amazing topic and, and woven throughout the scriptures throughout the Bible. And I haven't put it up here on the screen, but we actually understand that many of the Jewish people in the time of the Lord Jesus Christ actually understood that. And as an aside, you could go and have a look up the man called um, Lazarus. And his sister says, something interesting in relation to that and says when he had passed away and Jesus came to, to see them, said that she understood that in the last days that he would be raised from the dead. So from their Old Testament knowledge, it was always known that there was this fact that someone would be raised from the dead. But you see, how does that all tie together and in particularly in relation to the person, the character, our Lord Jesus Christ? See, in Acts chapter 26, verse 23, we'd read that Christ suffered, which we knew that he was hung on a cross, uh, a combination there of the Romans and the Jewish people working together to put him to death. To death. But from that, from that suffering of the termination of his life, being the forced termination and killing of him, that through that scenario, that he would then be raised from the dead. And we can read of that in, at the end of uh, most of the um, Matthew, Mark, Luke and John gospel records, that he's raised from the dead. And from that component of things in Acts chapter 26, it says here that he is the first that should be raised from the dead. Okay, so just as Jesus has been uh, taken up out of the grave, there is also the opportunity for others. If someone's the first, then who is the second, third, fourth, fifth? One hundredth, one thousandth, etc. But Christ is that first person to do this. 
at another point in First Corinthians chapter 15, uh, a chapter that uh, uh, discusses this in some detail. And uh, we've got here uh, some eight verses listed. And I'll read them for you. So if, now, if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, how say some of you that there is no resurrection of the dead? So the question was being raised that maybe there isn't a resurrection of the dead because something else is our reward, our hope. Well, the author of Corinthians says, then if there is no resurrection of the dead, then you've got to say that Jesus Christ has not been risen either. And if Christ has not been raised from the dead, then anything that we've been preaching to you, even today on this uh, seminar series and things that we're running here, has been pat particularly false or vain. It's been empty. And any faith that you've got is also empty. It says, yes, and we've, we would then be found to be false witnesses of God because we have testified of God that he raised up Jesus Christ. And apparently, according to these people, you are saying he has not raised him up, if it be that the dead rise not. For if the dead rise not, then is not Christ raised. And if Christ be not raised, your faith's in vain, and you're still in your sins, or you're still against God. Remember that word from earlier on, there's sins, you're, 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 you're broken, that has been passed on, the mortality has been passed on from father to son, or parents to child. That, that concept is that you are still stuck in that way. It says, then they also which have fallen asleep in Christ are perished. So people that have learned of the things of Jesus and then they pass away thinking that they have a hope, then that doesn't work either if Christ has not risen. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we would be of all people very miserable. But we know that Christ is risen from the dead and has become the first fruits or the first person of them that have slept. So, and that refers us back there to that very first quote up on the screen where Jesus was the first to be raised from the dead. And because of that, we understand that indeed, just as Christ is risen, then the hope for those people who have passed away is that they also may be raised from the dead. So what, what's next? Well, really quite simple. In Acts chapter 2, and we referred to this a couple of times there, um, last slide and before, the people that were listening to the disciples of Jesus tell the Jews about Jesus and how that he had died, they uh, were asking, they were pricked in their hearts, and they said to the apostles, men and brethren, what should we do? And Peter replies to them there, he says, you need to repent and be baptised. So repent means to change your ways. You need to consider what you've been doing to date and turn around and say, no, I need to do something else in relation to this. The second thing you need to do is be baptized. Now, baptism is a step that's acknowledging that God can save through his son, Jesus. We'd love to be able to talk to you more about what that means. So particularly if you've considered the topics that we've been presenting, not only here tonight, but also throughout our series online, if you're, or when we're back in the hall, if you've seen that, ask us about repenting and ask us about being baptised. I'd love to have that conversation with you because... As we read in Mark 16, 
if you believe, you repent, and you're baptized, there is the hope of salvation. And if you don't, then your life is just as it was. You're going to be condemned to continuing on the same as that we've always had. So I urge you to repent and be baptized. Come and understand what the great hope of the Bible is, and you indeed will be able to share with us in that time, in that day. So thank you. Looking forward to uh, seeing you all uh, when we can. And uh, hopefully this has been um, a small expose on the topic of a life after death.